Today we're going to be working on this cute little vanity that we just got finished. We're going to show you how to spray milk paint with a new sprayer that we've never tried before, how to hand brush a chair, upholster a chair, and how to make a cute little skirt. It should be lots of fun and just fair warning, there are some things that don't actually go our way. Also, big surprise, we've got a fun announcement of some things going on at the farmhouse. Today we're going to be using DIY White Swan, a handheld staple gun a knob that we need to replace, some sandpaper, and we're gonna be mixing up some milk paint in First Crush. Zep's gonna be spraying the vanity, but I am gonna be brushing this chair because I don't feel like cleaning out the spray gun. <laughs> and it's easy to just brush one little chair. I'm using DIY's White Swan and my Klingon F30. You can see that this brush puts that paint on there pretty good and about two coats will give us enough coverage for distressing. The nice thing about DIY paint is it is nice and thick, so if you have to brush, you're not putting on four coats to get coverage. I always start with my chair upside down, so that way I don't miss any spots. I'm like five minutes into this chair. <laughs> It doesn't take that long to paint if you get to it. The right brush makes all the difference. I like this brush because it has a lot of flex. And whenever I do like spindles on chairs, I always brush side to side, which is ex the exact opposite of going with the grain, but you just get so much better coverage. All right, we're gonna be mixing up this milk paint. I've got my immersion blender. You can use a fork or a whisk. You guys have seen me do all kinds of different ways to blend up my milk paint. But I'm going to be, usually I just kind of wing it on the thickness. Because I'm spraying it, I'm going to be very accurate. Milk paint mix up one part paint to one part water. Warm water is best. And that way I know how much to thin it down because you want to usually thin your paint down to three parts paint, one part water when you're spraying. This is 70 cc's. Now that I've got my scoops in, I'm going to use this same thing to measure the water. And then immersion blender going in. Every now and then I like to just take like a plastic fork or something and make sure that I'm scraping that bottom off and then it's all getting churned up because there's a little gap between the bottom and the blades spinning on this immersion blender and it might not get everything churned up. I know it's been a long time since we sprayed paint on this channel. I've got the Dynasta Siphon Feed Spray Gun and it's really simple to use. When you get this, it comes with this handy strainer Anytime you're spraying, it's a really good idea to strain your paint. You can see that straining through there. The milk paint with the immersion blender is going to be pretty smooth and creamy, but you don't want to take any chances of getting chunks because that's going to block your siphon up and then you have to clean it every time that happens. And it just goes a lot easier if you strain it first. I'm going to just let that sit and drain in there and then I will thin it down. I picked this air compressor up at Harbor Freight. It's a 20 gallon McGraw. I'm going to be honest, it's not the best for spraying. It worked really good building the house with my nail gun and a few other things that I needed to do. I have a 60 gallon air compressor. I have not hooked that up yet. That one works like a charm for spraying. I never have any weighting or anything like that. Right now you can see my tank is at 120 PSI and then I've just adjusted this down to 65, right around 65. And that's a pretty optimum place to spray at. And I might have to adjust it up or down from that depending on how thick my paint is. You, sometimes you gotta play with it a little. Right here on the side, it kind of gives you the layout of what it's going to be good at. And intermittent HVLP spray guns is in the red. <laughs> <laughs> but for this small project, it's going to actually work really, really well because I don't need to spray for hours on end. I probably will be done with one coat by the time I drain the first 20 gallons of air. The paint is strained. I use this to kind of rinse off my fork so it's got a little bit of peakish, but this is mostly water. So I'm going to just add one of these in there and then I'm going to stir it up and we'll see how this sprays. And then I might add a little of water. If I were to fill the hopper all the way up, it would be really easy to just mix up 20 ounces of milk paint, thin it out, you know, however I needed to. But since I didn't mix it all up because this is a small project, I'm gonna have to play with it a little bit and find that perfect sweet spot. Oh, 
always spray in a well-ventilated area. Use a respirator. If you can spray outside, that's great. We got windy conditions, so we're in here in the garage today. Even though this is a natural food safe paint, you still don't want to breathe that in. Looks like we've got it pretty good. It's a little on the watery side, so I might have to add a little bit of powder. I added too much water. You can see I'm getting a few little runs. I need to add more powder to my paint. It's too thin. Or I need to go really slow and just spray it right here. So I'm going to let that dry. You don't want to spray that more thinking that's going to help. And then what I'll do is I'll either sand it or come back and spray it some more. I need to thicken this mixture up just a little bit. Or if you let milk paint sit, it'll thicken up on its own. So I might just let it sit for a few minutes, come back and spray the rest of this. I'm going to continue doing just a real thin one coat on these legs and then I'll flip them over and that should be fine to spray the rest of it. So I've got it flipped right side up and one coat on those legs. It's drying really fast because it's pretty thin. I let the milk paint sit for just a little bit and it has thickened up. It's spraying really nice now. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this up. So we're getting the second coat on here and definitely second coat's going to give me enough coverage that I'll be ready to distress. If you weren't going to distress, you might have to do three coats, but I'm noticing that we're getting a little bit of bleed through in a few spots, nothing crazy. So what I'm going to do is instead of using like a liquid sealer, like big top or whatever, is after I distress it, I'm going to seal it with white wax. And usually that will lighten up. If it's not a heavy bleed through, it'll lighten it up and does the trick. So we'll see if that works. The Sweet Pickens milk paint that we use, that we carry at jamierayvintage.com, has an additive available called Extra Bond, and this will help it not chip so much. You can see we've got lots and lots of chipping here. I didn't put any Extra Bond in. The piece was pretty dry. I wasn't sure if it was going to need it or not, but pretty much this entire surface is flaking off. I'm going to sand this. I don't even need to sand it. I'm just brushing it with my hand. So if you've got a shiny surface and you're spraying, it might be a good idea to use the extra bond. I wanted to show you this so that you could see what you could expect. And maybe you love this really super ultra chippy look, but we're not going for quite that chippy on this piece. So I'm going to get this off of here and then I, I'm going to add some extra bond to my paint and repaint this real quick. It, should, it only takes about five minutes to repaint it and it only took a few ounces. I've got a little extra paint in here. Because we didn't put bond in the first coat, it still may do its own thing. So just be aware of that. If you don't want it to chip, start out with the extra bond. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to spray this on here and it's going to reactivate the paint on the top of this. So I'm not exactly sure what we're going to get. Jamie has given me her blessing that if it's really chippy, she'll, she'll be okay. So, so far what I'm seeing is that we're just getting really good texture on here and it's giving good coverage again. Hobby Lobby takes about half a yard for a chair this small and because the fabric's wide I actually could get two seats with it so I'll save this for another project. I put on here new batting and new foam because what was on here was pretty old and gross. I actually just folded up my batting that way it's nice and soft. I'll lay this over the top and flip it over in a poster. I always like to flip it over and check the top, make sure it looks good. This pattern is super busy, no straight lines, so this is a very easy fabric to do this with.
You want to pull this as neatly as possible. I've got a couple of puckers. Sometimes it's really important to make sure that before you get to the quarter that the sides are as tight as possible before you pull this back and then it'll kind of get rid of any ruffles, so to speak. Another important thing is cutting off the excess batting. You don't want a big wad of batting there. It will make it difficult to get a smooth edge. Careful not to cut your fabric. Yeah, don't cut your fabric or your finger. You'll see on the top side the puckering is minimum and this actually goes against the back of the seat so it's not as critical. Are you gonna show on your new heavy duty singer? <laughs> On camera? Yeah, we have another sewing machine and it's waiting for Ty to fix it, but he's busy making wood, so I bought a new sewing machine specifically to sew the skirt under the sink, which is now done. And now this is project number two for this particular machine. So far, so good. So I took the fabric, it's about a yard and a half left, and I cut it straight down the middle of the fabric. So this is going to be a shorter skirt. Um, that way I didn't have to buy so much fabric, otherwise it would have been really cost prohibitive. I've already done this one. I hemmed it on each side, then I'll hem it on the bottom. The top I'm not going to worry about hemming because I'll just fold it under and then staple it. So that's not really a big deal. I hate using pins. I just sew nice and slow. And I use the edge of my foot to guide and just make sure that it keeps the same distance. And I will go, I have a triple stitch. I will triple stitch all the way across and then I will come back and do a reverse stitch on the end just to make sure that that does not come undone. And I just keep this folded as I go. If I was doing something really involved and the fabric wasn't as thick or if it was slippery, I would definitely use pins. If you're a master seamstress, look away. So the next step is orbital distressing 220 sandpaper. Just gonna hit all the flat surfaces kind of along the edges and we'll do the chair too, then we'll be ready for wax. So we're using DIY's white wax on this chair because if we used a liquid sealer, it would pull out the bleed through that I can already see is coming. So I'm using the white wax because it won't pull out the bleed through and it'll kind of hide a little bit of the bleed through we have coming through. If it was really dark, it wouldn't work, but in this case, it's gonna be perfect. Are you going to do trim along the top? Little bit of ruffle in the back, a lot of bit of ruffle in the front. And I'm going to add more staples because you want to make sure it's not going. Now that we're to this point, we can glue like traditional trim on. You could use a nail head and just do brads all the way across to cover these up. You could do piping, whatever. I like to use my leftover fabric and because of the seat not being so wide, I had um, quite a bit left over. I cut it into equal strips, as you can see, and I ripped it so I got a frayed edge. Some people don't like that, so you could take it and flip it this way, sew it pull it out and then get a nice finished edge and just make it wider so you can ruffle it. But I love a frayed edge. I think it's so cute. So I just do a couple inches at a time because the glue dries. I always use high temp hot glue in my glue gun. And then I just pinch the, the little strips of fabric, almost like if, if you've ever done a pie crust and you had to ruffle the edge, just kind of pinch it as you go. And you can always, when I'm all done, I come back and I put an extra bead of glue in there just to make sure that it's really, really secure. And this is gonna cover up that, those staples, it'll cover up these weird nail holes in here and give us a cute little edge. We've got all this stuff here that was there. Stay 
tuned to the end of this video for a big project we have going on at the house. We're gonna go ahead and get this vanity listed up on our website now that it's done and it's in the shop. You know, we almost skipped over this piece. We're like, ah, will that fit in the vehicle? We had a bunch of other thrifted items, but it ended up coming home with us and I'm really glad it did because it turned out cool. We spent $20 on the vanity, $5 on the chair, and about $65 on the finishing products. We're gonna sell the set in the shop for $2.95 and we'll list it on our website with shipping for $5.95. If you're interested in this piece or any item that we have in the shop, you can visit jrvhome.com. That's where we sell our refinished, found, antique, and home decor items, as well as clothes and a myriad of other things. <laughs> if you want to paint a project like this, hit up jamierayvintage.com for the paint and products used today. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to Jamie Ray Vintage for more DIY. And I can't help but smile. Do you know how much I love you? You put my favorite song on I put my feet up And we just sing along And I can't help but feeling Just loving this moment Can we stay here forever? I'm loving this moment Can we stay here together? If I could stop the time, don't you know?